While all five components of ramen are challenging and time-consuming to make at home, none have been more mysterious and complicated as the art of noodle making. And this is probably because I'm kind of an idiot and once you start talking about gluten development and all of these fancy things with science, uh, my brain just turns off and I don't ever learn it properly. But not knowing everything about a topic hasn't really stopped me from making videos in the past before. In fact, that's kind of like the core essence of this channel. So what I'm gonna to try to do in this two-part series is show you everything that you need to know to make your perfect ramen noodle at home. This first video is gonna be all about the theory and science behind ramen making and its ingredients. And in the second video, I'll show you my updated technique that I'm currently using as of April, 2021. If I update it again, I'll make another video in the future. For this video, I enlisted the help of my buddy Mike Satinover, who also goes by the name Ramen Lord on the internet. When it comes to ramen making, Mike is much more knowledgeable than I am about pretty much every single aspect. So pretty much everything that I'm gonna say in this video, I learned from Mike, either from our conversation that we had about noodle making for this video or from reading his ebook. I'm gonna leave a link to both of those things in the description below because Mike goes really deep into a lot of these things I'm gonna talk about that I'm just not gonna be able to cram into this short video. So, all right, let's get right into this. So to really understand how to make great noodles, you kinda of have to understand what a noodle is. And so at its base level, a noodle is essentially a chain of gluten that is filled and covered with gel starch that comes from wheat flour. In wheat flour, you'll find many things, but most importantly when it comes to noodle making, you'll find proteins that will activate and link together to form gluten when exposed to water. And you'll also find starch, which will hydrate and then turn to gel when cooked in water. So basically when we're making noodles, we are forcing gluten to build a structure in one specific direction, which will then be filled with starch molecules, which will turn to gel when cooked in boiling water. We do this by rolling out the dough in just one specific direction. And if you're able to do just that, you're gonna be able to make some pretty good ramen noodles. But say you wanna take it to the next level and dial it in. Well, that's where this video comes in. I'm gonna tell you everything that you can do to tweak and make your own custom ramen noodle. The first things we can tweak and dial in are the core ingredients of a basic ramen noodle. So in ramen noodles, you have flour, water, kansui, which are alkaline salts, and salt. Let's go over each of these components one at a time to find out what happens as we change each of these variables. So one of the first things you can start to experiment with is the amount of water that you add to the dough. In my previous videos, I talked about how there can be high hydration noodles and low hydration noodles, with hydration being a percentage of the weight of water divided by the weight of the dry flour. A high hydration dough is anything that's over 35% hydration, and a low hydration dough is anything that is under 30% hydration. Adding more water to create a high hydration dough does a couple of things. One, it activates more of the gluten to make the dough more extensible. And two, it hydrates more of the available starch, which will change the way that starch cooks in boiling water. You'll find that high hydration doughs are easier to work with, more extensible, and when you cook the resulting noodle, the noodles will be softer than a low hydration noodle. A lower hydration noodle, on the other hand, will activate less gluten and it will hydrate less of the available starch. This means that the dough will be much harder to work, much firmer and stiffer, and the final noodle will also be firmer and stiffer as well. If you've ever had Hakata style tonkotsu ramen, those noodles in there are most likely low hydration noodles. It's actually pretty difficult to make real low hydration noodles at home with just the pasta machine. You usually require a lot more pressure to force that dough together. So it's okay, if you wanna make low hydration noodles or get the characteristics of low hydration noodles, just keep watching and there's other things that you can tweak to kind of mimic those effects. The second variable that we can tweak is the kansui or the alkaline salt in the noodle. In the US, the two easiest types of kansui to get are sodium carbonate and potassium carbonate. So I'm just gonna to stick to those two today and explain the differences between them. Sodium carbonate will produce a softer, chewier noodle, while potassium carbonate will produce a snappier, more brittle noodle. You can always blend the two types of kansui together to make a ratio that produces the kind of effects that you want. And you can also increase or decrease the amount of kansui that you add to your mix. Adding more kansui will give you more of that kansui smell in your final noodles, and it will also enhance those specific effects of that particular kansui. And likewise, decreasing the amount of kansui in your mix will decrease the smell and also those effects on the flour. 1% of the total weight of flour is a good baseline to use for how much kansui you want to add to noodle dough, but you can feel free to experiment and go up or down from there. But I would probably recommend capping it at a high of 2%. Once you go past 2%, you can start to taste the alkaline salt and those don't actually taste very good at all, really. The next thing you can adjust is the salt content. The amount of salt that you add can also be adjusted as well. Adding more salt will make your noodle saltier, obviously. But it also does some things to the gluten structure and the gluten development. Adding more salt does stiffen the dough and make it a little bit more firm. And it also helps with the cooking process in terms of getting the water in and out of the starch. But on the downside, it also seems to slow gluten development or gluten polymerization, so building those network structures. 
So for that reason, I kind of just tend to stick to 1% to 1.5% for salt. And I think Mike recommends not touching salt either, just leaving it at a 1%. So we can adjust other things, leave salt at around 1%. The last core ingredient that you can tweak is the flour. And flour is something that you can go pretty crazy on. Every single flour manufacturer uses their own specific type of wheat, which has its own specific protein levels and starch levels, and they blend flour in together. So you can really get kind of nuts with flour. Ideally, you're choosing flours that have sufficient amounts of protein to make the gluten structures that you need for your noodle. Bread flour is often a good choice because it's high in the proteins needed to make gluten. But if you're going to be making a high hydration noodle, you can get away with something like AP flour because the water will contact more of the available gluten, activating that and hydrating the starch gels. So that should be just fine. Different types of flours can also be blended in for flavor. Bread flour, AP flour, or noodle flour will always be your main base for your flours, but you can add 5-10% to of other things like wheat flour or rye flour like Ivan Orkin does to just add a little bit more depth of flavor to your noodles. When you start to develop your own noodles, Mike recommends choosing just one flour and sticking with that to fine tune your process. And then once you kind of have things that you kind of like, you're making noodles that you like, you can start to incorporate other flours and start to blend them. Basically stick to one brand of flour until you're making the best noodles that you can make, then you can start to experiment with other flours. And brings us on to our next topic, adjuncts. So say you tweak the measurements for all of the core ingredients for a basic noodle, but you're still not quite getting the noodle that you want. Maybe you want something that's chewier, or snappier, or snappier and chewier. And this is where the world of adjuncts come in. And adjuncts is a fancy word that Mike taught me that means things that you can add into your dough to enhance the characteristics of the core ingredients. There are tons of things you can add as adjuncts, but I'm gonna to stick to the most popular ones that people tend to use in the ramen community. Let's start off with eggs, because eggs are one of the most popular adjuncts that people use when they're making ramen noodles. Egg whites and egg yolks have different characteristics, so Mike tends to separate them, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. So adding egg whites does a few things to your noodles. Egg whites are hydrophobic by nature, which means they repel water. So this helps in a couple of ways. One, it's harder to overcook your noodle because the egg whites are gonna be kind of shielding the starch gels and things. And the second thing is that they tend to get less soggy in soup, uh, which is good for people that eat ramen slowly. In terms of textural effects that egg whites will add to your noodle, Egg whites will add resilience and make your noodle feel a little bit more springy. To get a general idea of what egg whites will do to your noodles, think about a hard boiled egg and how you can kind of press the egg whites and it kind of bounces back as you press on it. A little bit of that in noodles makes the noodle taste really good. Like it'll bring a lot of these really positive, chewy, snappy characteristics. And that's been my experience. Adding too much egg whites on the other hand will start to bring it more into the boiled egg white kind of texture, which is not something that you generally want when you're eating ramen. I've noticed for me personally that around 1% makes the noodles snappier, chewy, and kind of just really fun to eat. Mike also recommends one egg white per about 500 grams of flour or 1% of the total weight of flour if using powdered egg whites. Egg yolks on the other hand being mostly fat has kind of the opposite effect on noodle dough. The fats in egg yolks will shorten the gluten chains and make the dough and the noodles softer. Mike gives a good example of what it's like to add too much egg yolks. A great example of this is like ravioli, which often the dough of ravioli is made entirely from egg yolks. So there's very... Yeah, a lot less water, a lot higher fat content dough. And this makes the dough very supple, very easy to roll out and very tender, very, very delicate in texture. And you know, for ramen, most people don't necessarily want that. Mm -hmm. You might want some of it though. It just depends, what do you want? Whole eggs and egg yolks are used all the time in Japanese ramen shops. I'm not trying to scare you away from using whole eggs or egg yolks, it's just that they need to be used thoughtfully to get the desired results that you want. Another really popular adjunct is vital wheat gluten, which is basically just pure gluten that you can add into your noodle dough to get more gluten in there to build those structures that we need for the noodle. Adding vital wheat gluten to your noodles will make your dough firmer and more elastic and also your noodles firmer and more elastic. To get an idea of the characteristics that extra vital wheat gluten might add to your noodles, think about a really chewy, dense bread and those kind of characteristics will be brought into your noodles with vital wheat gluten. In my experience, adding vital wheat gluten makes the sheeting process for the dough a little bit more tricky because the added elasticity makes it harder to roll out. The dough kind of wants to go back to its original shape, so it requires a little bit more resting. Nevertheless, vital wheat gluten is a very valuable tool. If you feel like your noodles are always a little bit too soft, try adding 1% of the weight of flour of vital wheat gluten. Usually when we use things like vital wheat gluten, we subtract from the weight of the total flour to add in the vital wheat gluten. So for an example, 
If you're doing 1% vital wheat gluten for 100 grams of flour, you'll do 99 grams of flour and then one gram of vital wheat gluten. And that's kind of how we do most adjuncts actually. The next adjunct I'm gonna talk about is rice flour. And rice flour is only really used for one thing. It's to make your noodles more slippery. So if you want slippery, slurpery noodles, just add a little bit of rice flour to your mix. Five to 10% of the total weight of flour. And just like with vital wheat gluten, you would swap out that percentage of bread flour or flour with the rice flour instead. The last adjunct I'm gonna talk about is tapioca flour. And tapioca flour is an interesting one because it does kind of create a gluten-like structure, but it doesn't have some of the other gluten characteristics. If you want an image of what adding tapioca flour will do to your noodles, think about like boba teas, like boba, bo what is it called, boba? Boba, bo what are those things called? Boba pearls. Those are pure tapioca. And so that texture when you're biting into a boba pearl is a little bit of that can go into your noodle if you add tapioca flour. In my experience, adding a little bit of tapioca flour makes the noodles chewier, but it doesn't make the dough sheeting process any more difficult, like when you add vital wheat gluten, for example. Again, five to 10% of the weight of flour with tapioca flour, and again, swapping out the bread flour for the added tapioca flour. Again, there are many other adjuncts that you can try and experiment with, but these are just the main ones that people tend to use, and just dialing in these things often gets you the noodle that you want. One last variable that you can tweak for your noodles is the final resting time of the noodle. Most ramen noodles need to be rested. When you rest the noodle, the gluten that you developed will relax, these starch gels will get a chance to equalize, leading to more even cooking when you finally cook them, these tiny micro air pockets will kind of work their way out of the noodle. So that will prevent the bloating of noodle that you usually get when you cook a noodle right away. Kansui smell will kind of decrease a little bit. There's a lot of benefits to resting your ramen noodle. But where you rest them can also make a huge difference as well. I generally recommend people rest it in the fridge because it's safer there, like less chance for bacteria to grow. But a lot of people swear by resting your noodles at room temperature on the counter. Resting at room temperature does something kind of weird to the gel starch. Uh, it kind of makes the noodles translucent when you cook them. I'm not really sure what it is, and here's Mike's theory of what's going on. I can only hypothesize why this is, and in my book I write about like my hypotheses for why this is. But my hypothesis is that when you put a dough in the fridge, the starches become very cold. And when they become very cold, they are not very fluid. They don't flow very quickly, right? I mean, you see this in all sorts of different stuff that things become more rigid at cold temperatures than at room temperature. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, the little air pockets that are still kind of caught in the dough are a little more trapped in suspension. They're kind of stuck in the noodle. When you rest the dough at room temperature, the starch gel is more fluid. And that means that, that those air pockets kind of get collapsed on and kind of condense. And so when you have a noodle that's been rested for a long time at room temperature, it has like a translucent look to it. Yeah. It looks translucent. Of course, there are problems with that resting thing. Namely, if you rest at room temp too long, you're definitely gonna get some pathogen growth. So basically after resting, you understand everything that you can tweak to make your perfect ramen noodle. The best way to develop your own noodles is to think about what characteristics you want, then try out the adjuncts or the changes that you need to make to get that characteristic in the noodle to come out. Here is Mike explaining how he developed his Tokyo shoyu noodle. It's interesting because typically a Tokyo ramen noodle is like 36%. But at the time of developing that recipe, I just could not get 36% to work easily on a Mercado Atlas without like hating myself. So the development was, well, I need to bump up the hydration here. I can do 38%. But when I do that, this noodle is going to be softer. And I don't want a soft noodle for this dish. I want a kind of thinner, snappier, straighter noodle. So I don't want, uh, I don't want this noodle to be like a kitakata noodle where there's so much gluten development happening, but I want that kind of texture. So I just started playing around with it. Uh, the first one was adding egg white because I saw on a recipe that somebody was adding egg white and I liked the texture, <laughs> again, 1%. And then I wanted further resiliency because my hydration was higher than I wanted it to be. So I added a little bit of gluten. That's kind of where it came from. So that's about it for this video. In the next video, I'll be taking you through my current process of making noodles. But if you have any questions about any of this stuff, feel free to hit me up on Instagram at Way of Ramen. Also feel free to hit up Mike as well. He's on Instagram at ramen underscore underscore lord. There's two underscores in there. He's really good with answering all these questions. And he actually knows a lot more than me anyway. So you might just want to hit him up instead. Again, please check out his book. It's free. It's an ebook. You can just read it and it's pretty much all of his knowledge in print form. And you can also listen to our conversation about noodle making where I got pretty much all of the ideas for this video. I'll link up both his book and that conversation in the description below.
Thank you all for watching and for all the support, and I'll see you all in the next video where we make some noodles. Peace.